Wealth is a major indicator of economic inequality. Millions of families nationwide lack resources necessary to secure their financial futures. Tonight, we discuss wealth equality across various racial and ethnic groups. Sergio, tell me a little bit about where you come from because your background is what makes you Sergio today. Sure. So I want to go all the way back, if you don't mind. Not at all. So five generations ago uh, in Mexico, um, I had an ancestor, uh, a great-great-grandfather, who was a Huasteco indigenous man, okay? And he became a physician, and he became the physician of the, what became the president of Mexico, who, who could also be called a dictator, because he, he ran his term for 30 years. And, and he became a very important person in Mexico. And so what you see in me is actually the falling dagger of that family line, right? And so I had a whole series of, of individuals in my family that were very, very successful, very, very uh, important to a nation, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I was brought to this country at the age of three, I lost all of that social capital, right? And I grew up um, sort of in, in Orange County as a middle class, privileged, but um, nowhere near the level of privilege that I would have had had I stayed in Mexico City. And, and the reason why I'm telling you all this is because it's an important dynamic that is, is actually very unique. Typically when people talk about Mexican immigration, they don't see somebody who's, who's falling in social capital. They see somebody who is um, adopted what would be the American dream, and they think that they're going to go from the lowest of the possible um, social castes, if you will, mm -hmm. to something like middle class or beyond, right? And so um, I think it's important for me to, to come from that point of privilege and to say there, there's actually another path. Because you went, all, you went backwards. When you, <laughs> yes. That's right. Wow. And, and it's an important thing today because um, I don't think, for example, and this is uh, many, many generations later, I don't think I'll be as successful as my father was even. And I know I'll definitely not be as successful as my great-great-grandfather, right? And so that's sort of a, a dynamic that has led to why I do the work that I do is because I've sort of always felt uncomfortable um, in the United States from an immigrant perspective and, and also with um, you would have to get into the dynamics of Orange County and what it's like to be a Mexican in Orange County and what it's like to be a, a, such a unique Mexican like I, I have been. And your background is as a venture capitalist and we're going to talk about what you're doing now but your background is so important to what you're doing today so tell us a little bit about that. So my background is as a banker and um, I've been working in venture capital for the last seven years. And venture capital is, is actually a pretty significantly large industry. And the, the part of it that I've been working on is what they call angel funding. And tell me about this angel funding and the reason why you think that there's inequality today. I'm not gonna use the right words, but it's like a governing body for all angel capital in the United States. Okay. It's called the Angel Capital Association. And so what they do is they take all of these groups of angel investors and um, those investors provide data back to the Angel Capital Association and they release it to the public as something that's called the HALO report. And so just to give you an idea of the state of angel funding in the United States, when that data comes back, there's essentially four categories for individuals that are represented. The first is the white male. The second is the non-white male. The third is the white female. And the fourth is the non-white female. So there is nothing of, like, it, if you're black, if you're Latina, if you're Asian, you get lumped into a non-white female category okay and 
Roughly, if you were to take all of 100% of angel fundings that happen in the United States, that non-white female is getting less than 3% of, of that 100%. And so then if you drill down into my specialty, which is Latinos or Latinas, they don't even get to a fraction of 1% of the, t of the angel fundings that are successful in a given year. But it's important to know that that's a reality, but nobody's even counting you do not get accounted for as a Latina or as a black female. You just go into the non-white category. So they have one category for a large group of people, and then based on that category, which is really small, only a small, even a smaller percentage gets that capital. Yeah. So what, can, what have you been trying to do to help widen that gap, and I'm not putting you on the spot, <laughs> but I'm sure you have been doing something. I, I've been failing. I've been struggling, right? So um, typically what, what I have seen in my seven years in doing this is uh, white males come through the door with resources and with all of the things necessary to have their startups be funded. We don't typically see anything other than that. And so... Does that lead to why you are doing the nonprofit work that you're doing today? So to a certain extent. So the work that I'm doing in the nonprofit world today is tied to um, not to entrepreneurship the way that the venture capital industry sees it. Um, they call it social enterprise in the nonprofit world. And it's how are, would you, if you're an undocumented mother, living in South Los Angeles, with all of the obstacles that you have in front of you to earn a living, how are you gonna do it? And so that's what this work is about. And so what have you done to make sure that people get over these barriers? So it, it's not so much about me, I know that it should be about me, but I followed uh, an executive that, that I um, respect a lot. Her name is Dr. Michelle Burton. And she brought me into this very storied nonprofit in South Los Angeles that's called Community Health Councils. Community Health Councils was uh, established uh, during the, the last uh, uprising in 1992 mm -hmm. as a part of a, an effort that was called Rebuild LA. And so Community Health Councils has a division that's called the Social Change Institute and they produce a capacity building workshop that's called Leading for Equity. And so I was brought into Leading for Equity to be somebody who could facilitate that capacity building for this particular audience of, of mostly women. Right now what we see in, in the workshops that we've done to date, it's been about 80% are, are uh, Latinas and about 20% are about elder black women. And so that's been the makeup of, of this particular community in South Los Angeles. And so this is very personalized. And you actually have to meet with each one of these candidates individually to come up with their stories. Absolutely. How difficult is that, especially with the amount of people that you're servicing right now? So that, that is actually one of the big problems. Um, right now we have about 50 participants in, in the workshop. And, and I actually tap my network um, from, from other industries to support them. Um, but yeah, so by our calculations, uh, the research that we've done at Community Health Councils, I estimate that there's about 250,000 of this particular type of person that could use that capacity building. We, we do get support. I think where the nonprofit world is, is very complicated is that usually they're funding programs and they're usually funding them at short term. And so what, what needs to happen at some point as, as you begin to show impact is you need to get multi-year funding and you need to um, have more funders, if you will. It's a, a, a common problem in the nonprofit world.
is funding. Yeah, definitely understand that. And so I want to talk a little bit about your source material because sure. that was one of the major things that I was so impressed with. So tell us a little bit about that and tell us how you use that. And then you can even tell us how you developed it. Sure. So um, I gave you an idea of, of what the workshop looks like in terms of the individual identities, right? Mm -hmm. um, typically what ends up happening, at least in my world, especially in the world of venture capital, um, but this applies to almost every industry, including the media industry, which is that when you go to provide source material to those individuals, it's usually coming from the same place, and that same place is usually written by an adult white male. Typically, that, the best that you can hope for is an adult white male from Harvard. Like that is the, the creme de la creme of source material. And so what, what does end up happening a lot is that somebody will bring something in from the Harvard Business Review and they'll try to apply it at the street level with these types of individuals. And so that's the first thing that I saw is that the source material that I was given does not apply to the types of individuals that I'm working with. And so what I really wanted to do was to create that source material so that the individual that I'm working with can see themselves in the source material. You have given us so much information, Sergio. People are watching right now and they want to know how they can get in contact with you to help you continue your service in the community. So can you give us a little information about that? Sure, so once again, the organization that I'm doing this for is called Community Health Councils. They have a website. It's chc-inc.org. And there's a section on the website for the Social Change Institute. And then there's a, a call out, what we call it, um, for this particular program that's called Leading for Equity. And you, you mentioned that you have funders and people volunteering, but there's more that can always be needed, right? Absolutely. And I th one of the things that I wanted to try to express is that even if you get a program funded, like let's say you have a program that's for 50 individuals, you can get that program funded. Like it's still hard, but it's, it's possible. What there is no funding for is for going from 50 to 250,000, right? The scale of something that, that doesn't provide a return on investment that, that like an investor would be able to calculate, right? And so, you know, one thing is, you know, struggling to get the funding for a specific program and another thing is, is uh, struggling to get the funding for the scale of that particular program. And so it sounds like what you're trying to do is really bridge a gap with who's the writer versus who is the audience. That's right. Excellent. Oh, Sergio, thank you so much for your time and telling us a little bit about your background and how it's led you to be this champion, and that's what I consider you right now, a champion <laughs> for people bringing equity to all humankind. So thank you so much for your time tonight. For sure. And thank you for joining us on Everybody with Angela Williamson. It's viewers like you that make this show possible. Stay in touch with us on social media. Good night and stay well. Thank you.